Welcome, everyone, and thank you for standing by. I would like to advise you that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Also, all participants will be in listen-only mode for the duration of today's call. I would now like to turn the conference over to Michael Hawes from the U.S. Census Bureau. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, operator, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third webinar in our series on understanding the 2020 Census Disclosure Avoidance System. Today's session will provide a deeper discussion of some of the concepts underlying our implementation of differential privacy in the 2020 Census Disclosure Avoidance System's top-down algorithm. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, Michael Ratcliffe, Senior Advisor for Frames in the Census Bureau's Geography Division, uh, who will be speaking in a little while about the top-down algorithm's geographic hierarchy. Also on the line are my colleagues, Megan Maury, Michelle Hedrick, Philip Leclerc, Pavel Zhurlev, and Ryan Cummings, who will be answering your questions um, during the presentation via WebEx's Q&A feature. So as you uh, come up with questions, just type those into the Q&A. Please send them to all panelists, uh, and they will be uh, responding to them in real time during the presentation today. Before I start, uh, I want to thank my Census Bureau colleagues and our external partners who have contributed to the information in this presentation. I'd also like to thank the many external stakeholder groups who have provided invaluable feedback that has helped us improve the disclosure avoidance system over the past few years. Uh, I'd also like to state that any opinions and viewpoints expressed today are entirely my own and do not represent the opinions or viewpoints of the U.S. Census Bureau. The 2020 Disclosure Avoidance System's top-down algorithm, or TDA for short, uh, will be the method used to implement differential privacy noise infusion, sorry, differentially private noise infusion, excuse me, uh, for the first set of 2020 census data products, uh, which include the Public Law 94171 redistricting data, uh, the demographic profiles, uh, and the demographic and housing characteristics files. The TDA will also be used for any special tabulations of the 2020 census. There are several requirements that TDA has been designed to meet. First, the system must be able to ingest the census edited file microdata and geographic reference file and must output the microdata detail file that will feed into decennial tabulation systems. Next, the algorithm must be able to hold certain data elements exactly as enumerated. We call these invariants. And the list of invariants set by the Census Bureau's Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, or DSEP for short, includes total population at the state level, the number and type of occupied group quarters facilities at the block level, and the number of housing units, whether occupied or not, at the block level. In addition to these invariants, TDA must be able to constrain values according to certain edit rules that were enforced on the census edited file. These include structural zeros, like not allowing three-year-old grandmothers, uh, as well as rules that require each occupied group quarters facility to have at least one occupant, among many others. Perhaps most importantly, the system must allow DSEP to determine the overall balance between privacy protections and the resulting data's fitness for use along with the ability to prioritize accuracy across different tabulations at different levels of geography. And we'll talk more about this in a few moments. The system must be able to ensure that the selection of privacy loss budget directly controls the resulting accuracy of the data. Essentially that as you increase the privacy loss budget to infinity, the algorithm will eventually output the original Ceph microdata. And lastly, transparency. Uh, all of the design, code, and parameters of the disclosure avoidance system must be able to be made public. At a high level, the TDA has five steps. It inputs the census edited file microdata and the geographic reference file geocoding. Then it converts those microdata to a functionally equivalent histogram of counts. Uh, you can think of this as a fully saturated contingency table of every variable crossed with every other variable, with the value of those cells being the number of people at that level of geography who have those specific characteristics, along with all structural zeros, which are the impossible values according to the edit rules for the Ceph having been removed. 
Then the algorithm asks a number of queries uh, and injects noise into those results. Uh, we call this the noisy measurement stage. And I'll talk more about this step in a moment. Armed with these noisy measurements, the system must then perform a set of optimization problems. Uh, these are designed to ensure consistency across tables and geographies and to ensure that the final histogram is populated with non-negative integer counts. Finally, the algorithm transforms the resulting histogram back into privacy-protected microdata that can be output into the decennial tabulation systems. I mentioned that the first stage of the top-down algorithm is the conversion of the confidential census edited file, or CEPH, microdata into a histogram that is functionally equivalent and a complete representation of the microdata itself. To understand what this actually means, here's a simple illustration. On the left, we have nine microdata records, including their geographic location and all of their reported characteristics. To convert these into a histogram, you identify all possible permutations of the location and every characteristic, and then count the number of records in the microdata file with that exact combination of location and characteristics. This set of record frequencies is the histogram, which is used to take the noisy measurements for the TDA processing. After all of the processing and post-processing steps, which we will discuss in a moment, the end product of the top-down algorithm is a privacy-protected version of this histogram, which can then be fully converted back into microdata by writing individual microdata records for each of these record counts with their corresponding location and unique combination of characteristics. These privacy-protected microdata then feed into the decennial tabulation system to produce the official census data products. So let's dive a little deeper into some of the steps in the TDA process. The noisy measurement step is what protects privacy in the algorithm. Before TDA goes into production, uh, our Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee will be setting the privacy loss budget for the redistricting data product, and will determine the allocation of that privacy loss budget across the different queries that support the PL file and across the different levels of geography at which those queries are performed. With those allocations of privacy loss budget in hand, the algorithm adds noise to each query that is performed against the confidential data. The noise that is added is taken from a probability distribution with a mean of zero and with a variance that is determined by the share of the privacy loss budget allocated to that particular query at that level of geography. These noisy measurements are all independent of each other uh, so they may not be internally consistent, and they can include negative values. That is, it might say that a block that actually has zero Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander residents now has negative one Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander residents. In order to meet the microdata output requirement of the TDA, these noisy query answers need to go through post-processing to make them internally consistent and non-negative and we'll be discussing this post-processing step in a moment. But first, let's look a little more closely at noise probability distributions. Using our histogram illustration from a moment ago, imagine you wanted to ask three queries of the confidential data for this particular block. What is the total population? How many males are there? How many females? And how many members of each reported racial group? Well, to take the noisy measurements, the TDA sums up the corresponding number of records that satisfy that particular query. Then it adds or subtracts a small amount of noise to the total. In this example, you'll see that three of the queries receive zero noise. That's because the probability distribution from which the amount of noise is randomly selected is centered on zero. So there's a higher likelihood of the algorithm adding no noise for any given query. Plus or minus one occurs with the next greatest frequency, plus or minus two with slightly less likelihood, and so on. One important thing to notice in this example is that the different sets of queries, total versus male plus female versus the sum of the individual race categories, give slightly different values for the block's population, nine versus eight versus 10. 
These inconsistencies in the noisy measurements require post-processing to make them consistent. And we'll talk more about how this post-processing is done shortly. Delving a little deeper into the mechanics of the probability distributions uh, that we use to select the amount of noise added to the noisy measurements, uh, in the fall of 2020, the Census Bureau made a change in the top-down algorithm from traditional differential privacy, injecting noise to each statistic from the geometric distribution, which is the discrete equivalent of the Laplace probability distribution, uh, shown here in green, uh, to concentrated differential privacy, uh, injecting noise from a discrete Gaussian distribution, shown here in purple. We implemented this change based on feedback we received from our data users, who were concerned about the occurrence of significant outliers in the earlier demonstration data products that we had released. The notable distinction between geometric noise and discrete Gaussian noise is how those mechanisms handle the tails of the distributions. Gaussian distributions have much flatter tails than their geometric counterparts, uh, meaning that any particular statistic would have less likelihood of receiving an unusually large amount of noise with a Gaussian mechanism than it would with a geometric mechanism for the same overall level of privacy protection. So among other things, this change helped us to reduce the occurrence of outliers in the resulting data for any comparable level of privacy. I should note, for the sake of illustration, this image shows continuous Laplace and Gaussian distributions. But the top-down algorithm actually uses discrete versions of these distributions, so only integer values of noise can be selected. Our switch to concentrated differential privacy also implies, sorry, improves the efficiency of the privacy loss budget uh, because ZCDP composes better than traditional mechanisms of differential privacy. Uh, essentially, the privacy loss budget goes further uh, under ZCDP. Delving a little deeper into this change, it's helpful to examine some of the differential privacy parameters and how they relate to privacy protection. Differential privacy is, at its core, a framework for providing a mathematical guarantee of the maximum amount of confidential information leakage, privacy loss or privacy risk, associated with publishing any statistic. The switch from geometric noise to discrete Gaussian noise significantly reduces the likelihood of outliers, yielding substantially greater accuracy for comparable privacy risk. It does so in part by modifying the mechanics of this mathematical guarantee. We know that the publication of any statistic calculated from a confidential data source will inevitably reveal a small amount of confidential information in the process, or privacy loss. In traditional implementations of differential privacy, the privacy loss parameter is represented by the Greek letter epsilon. The value of epsilon establishes the absolute upper bound on the amount of privacy loss that can occur. And shares of epsilon are allocated to each query and then summed to the global value of epsilon for the data product. In ZCDP, Privacy loss accounting is modified from the mathematical framework of pure DP uh, and is quantified instead by the, the paired parameters, epsilon and delta. By altering how the mechanism deals with unlikely events, the tails of the noise distribution, concentrated differential privacy using a Gaussian distribution adds the probabilistic term delta to interpreting the mathematical guarantee represented by epsilon. In this framework, delta can be interpreted as the minuscule likelihood, such as one chance in 10 billion, that the amount of privacy loss might possibly exceed the upper bound established by epsilon. In concentrated differential privacy, epsilon and delta always interact as a pair, uh, and the same relative accuracy can be interpreted as many different paired values of these terms. For example, to meet a specific accuracy target, the same noise distribution used to protect the statistics can be represented by many different epsilon delta pairs, a smaller epsilon with a higher delta or a larger epsilon with a smaller delta. These different pairs of values, hypothetically, for example, uh, an epsilon of four with a delta of 10 to the negative six uh, versus an epsilon of eight with a delta of 10 to the negative 10, 
uh, represent exactly the same noise distribution, but help you interpret your confidence in the upper bound of privacy loss that's reflected by that value of epsilon. With this example, you would know that the probability of the privacy loss possibly exceeding an epsilon of four is one in a million. Uh, and the chance of it exceeding epsilon of eight would be one in 10 billion. In this regard, selection of delta is a policy decision, but only insofar as it determines how you're going to interpret and account for the mathematical privacy guarantee itself. Uh, it does not directly impact the resulting accuracy of the data. Currently, the Census Bureau's privacy accounting uses a value of delta of 10 to the minus 10, uh, so our published values of epsilon should be interpreted accordingly. Uh, the other parameter introduced by ZCDP is represented by the Greek letter rho. In ZCDP, rho is related to epsilon, but is calculated differently. While in traditional DP, privacy loss budget is allocated via shares of epsilon, uh, in ZCDP, privacy loss budget is allocated by shares of the parameter rho. Uh, these shares can then be added up and the global rho can be converted into its corresponding value of epsilon for your chosen level of delta. And you'll see this in practice a little later in the presentation. So now that we've discussed how the noisy measurements work, how do we deal with negative noisy values? or values that don't sum consistently. Well, this is done through post-processing of those noisy measurements, and it's at the center of how the top-down algorithm operates. So how does the algorithm perform this post-processing? Well, as the name suggests, we use a top-down approach. The algorithm starts by post-processing the national level histogram, then moves its way down each level of the geographic hierarchy, processing those histograms in turn, until it gets all the way down to the individual census block level. At each geographic level, the algorithm takes the noisy query answers for that level of geography, uh, the invariance, which I discussed before, and the structural and rule-based constraints, which I mentioned previously, uh, and then determines the internally consistent non-negative integer histogram that best reflects those noisy answers from the noisy measurements. As the algorithm moves down the geographic hierarchy, the histogram values determined for the geographic level above it get added to the set of constraints which, within which the algorithm must optimize. The design of the top-down algorithm has a number of important advantages over other possible implementations of differentially private noise infusion for these data. The recursive process down the geographic hierarchy ensures that the disclosure limitation error does not increase when you aggregate census blocks to higher level geographies. Uh, this would not be the case with a bottom-up approach, uh, which would result in higher geographic levels having significantly greater amounts of noise. And this is a key feature of official statistics that we wanted to ensure TDA observed, that the accuracy of your statistics improve as the measured population size increases. Lastly, TDA has a helpful efficiency built in, uh, insofar as the algorithm allows lower levels to inherit accuracy or borrow strength from the measurements taken at higher levels. This helps improve count accuracy at lower geographic levels without expending additional privacy loss budget. So I showed a moment ago how the top-down algorithm performs the post-processing steps descending along a geographic hierarchy, or geographic spine, as we often call it. Uh, it's important to note that TDA only takes noisy measurements for geographic units on the hierarchy. So accuracy for on-spine geographies will normally be higher than the corresponding off-spine geographies of comparable size. But many legal and political geographies of interest are off-spine. Uh, therefore, their accuracy is impacted by the accuracy of the minimum number of on-spine geographies that could be used to construct them. That is, by the number of on-spine geographic units that would need to be added or subtracted to construct the geography of interest. To address this challenge, uh, the Disclosure Avoidance System team made changes to the geographic hierarchy uh, to improve the accuracy of off-spine uh, geographical entities. 
This was done primarily through the creation of what we call optimized block groups, uh, whereby the algorithm reconfigures block group boundaries to bring these off-spine entities closer to the spine, essentially minimizing uh, the, that off-spine distance, uh, and also by isolating group quarters facilities from their surrounding areas. Uh, as can be seen in the April 2021 demonstration data, this optimization of the geographic spine significantly improves accuracy for off-spine entities and was central to our ability to tune the algorithm for the Redistricting and Voting Rights Act use cases. I want to stress, however, that the optimization of the geographic hierarchy only impacts how TDA operates. It will not affect tabulation geographies in the published census data products. So to explain how the optimization of the TDA's geographic hierarchy was done, I'll turn things over to my colleague, Mike Ratcliffe, a senior advisor for frames in our geography division. Thank you, Michael. If you could go to the next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about how we rethought the geographic hierarchy. So in Michael's last slide, we saw the central hierarchy in the Census Bureau's geographic, overall standard geographic hierarchy, or the central axis, if you want to call it that. Each of the types, and we'll see this again in, in the next slide, in the slide that follows. Each of the types of geographies in that hierarchy or that spine nests neatly within the higher level entity types. So it's a, a very nice, neat um, uh, aggregation of geographic units. So it blocks add up to block groups, block groups to tracks, tracks to counties, and so on, all the way up to the, to the U.S. But there are, of course, as Michael mentioned, there are other geographic entity types that are important to data uses, and these other off-spine entities intersect with the on-spine entities in myriad and sometimes complex ways. So the challenge to us, and we heard this in meetings with stakeholders, external stakeholders, the challenge was to provide for the direct measurement of population and characteristics for American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian areas and sub-state legal geographic areas when applying the differential privacy method. There are, of course, many other geographic areas that we publish data for, uh, but these were the primary, these were the key geography, types of geography that we heard uh, from our stakeholders that were critical and important. So the consideration, so that was our challenge. The consideration uh, was that, and Michael alluded to this, the larger the number of geographic areas on the geographic hierarchy or the spine, and the more intersections between geographic areas that are formed when one type of area overlaps with another, the more thinly the privacy loss budget is distributed, impacting the accuracy of data for all geographic areas. So our solution has been to bring the legal American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian areas on as well as places, uh, incorporated places and census designated places in 38 states and towns and cities and towns and townships in 12 states closer to the spine for DAS processing. Now, those of you who know uh, our census geography and our types of geography know that census designated places aren't, are not legal entities. They're unincorporated communities, yet they are quite, they are in, quite important in some states as uh, place level entities. So when we say legal, we'll use that with a, a little bit of um, uh, poetic license and include the unincorporated places in 38 states and in the American Indian Alaska Native areas. We are also including the Oklahoma tribal statistical areas, which are the former reservations that existed in Oklahoma, as well as the Alaska Native village statistical areas, which are the statistical representation of the legally existing Alaska Native villages. Next slide, please. So to kind of recap our standard hierarchy, uh, we saw this again in uh, Michael's last slide, uh, but this is our the, the usual view uh, that we that you'll see in our in our products and on our website, and you can see the central hierarchy there in the middle, the step, the central spine uh, of blocks, block groups, tracks, counties, or if you go top down, nation, regions, divisions, states, and so on. I've highlighted in the box um, the the, uh, the geographic entities that are of importance uh, in the uh, that are importance in the in the DAS processing, so states, counties, tracts, and so on. And again, as you can see, there are many other 
geographic areas off the spine, off of those sides, off the sides that intersect in a variety of places. On the right is a, a conceptual view of the two pathways we're taking in optimizing the off-spine geographies. So we start at the U.S., and then within each state, we break that state into, or we divide the state into the portion of the state that is within American Indian, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian areas. And in 2010, there are 36 states. In the 2010 geography, there are 36 state areas that fall into that category. For 2020, there will be 38. There's a new uh, off-reservation trust land in Tennessee and a new off-reservation trust land in Indiana. So there's a, those are the two additional states that you'll see uh, with American Indian areas in in 2020. And then on the non-American Indian area pathway, we have 51 state or state equivalent areas that um, are the portions of those states that are not within American Indian areas. And you can see then we follow that pathway down uh, through counties and tracts and block groups, blocks, the optimized block groups that Michael was talking about. Next slide, please. So how does this work for the American Indians? What is the, the state portion, the state American Indian area that we're talking about? In this example, we're looking at Kansas, and there are three uh, American Indian areas, four if you want to treat the off-reservation trust land as a separate entity. But there are three American Indian areas in Kansas that are grouped together at the state level and then are used uh, in the processing, in the post-processing, uh, in the um, optimization. So the Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska reservation and off-reservation trust lands, Kickapoo, Kansas reservation, and the Prairie Band, Potawatomi Nation reservation. Next slide, please. Now, before we turn to the non-American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian path, I'd like to spend a little bit of time discussing the regional variations in incorporated places in minor civil divisions. We took the variation in the primary units of local government into account in our optimization, and I talked about the 38 states where we're focused on place, incorporated places and census designated places, and then the 12 states where we focus on minor civil divisions. Uh, town, cities, boroughs, towns, and townships. Those 12 states are what we refer to sometimes as the strong minor civil division states. And in this map, they are the, the, the states in purple, in the darkest shading of purple. The nine states in the northeast, and then also the three upper Midwest states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. In these states, the minor civil divisions, or and minor civil divisions are a category of county subdivisions in our census geography. And the minor civil divisions, again, these are cities, boroughs, towns, and townships. Uh, the, the MCDs in these states have active functioning governments on par with the incorporated places in other states. So these are the primary units of local government in those states. And so it was critical to take those in, those, those, the MCDs in those states into account and distinguish them from the political geography that we see, the, the variety of political geography we see in the, or legal geography in the other states. Uh, and those would be all of the other uh, states in the various shades, the other shades of purple, the lilac, and then the green. All right, next slide, please. So focusing on the geographic hierarchy, on the more important sub-state geographic entities, uh, so we focused on the geographic hierarchy on the more important sub-state geographic entities in recognition of the regional variations that exist. I talked about the 12 strong minor civil division states. In those, we optimized block groups. The optimized block groups were configured to bring the minor civil division closer to the spine. Again, those are the primary units of local government in those states. They often, uh, they are county subdivisions, and in many instances, the tracks and block groups will nest within those geographies. Uh, that's especially true in New England. In the other 38 states, the non-strong minor civil, civil division states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, the optimized block groups were configured to bring places, again, uh, closer to the spine. And if you're familiar with our summary levels, that's summary level 160, state place. 
And again, that includes not only the legal incorporated places, but also the unincorporated census designated places that we define in cooperation with local officials. And I believe that's the end of my slides, Michael, so I'll turn it back to you. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh, in addition to our spine optimization, uh, there are a few other features of the top-down algorithm worth discussing. Back in 2019, as we were producing the first demonstration data product using 2010 census data, we mo noticed some unusual behavior in the top-down algorithm. Apparently, the algorithm had difficulty effectively performing the post-processing for large queries with a substantial number of zeros or small values. Uh, the sparsity of the histogram resulted in some substantial biases in the resulting processing. Effectively, we were shifting people from urban centers to rural areas and from large population groups to smaller ones. To mitigate this effect, uh, we modified the algorithm in a number of ways, but most importantly, to, we modified it to be able to run in a series of passes uh, rather than performing all of the optimizations for each geographic level at once. Uh, this allows the algorithm to optimize certain query sets and then use those results as constraints for the subsequent processing of the subsequent queries. Uh, in the context of the redistricting data, this is relatively straightforward. Uh, at most geographic levels, the top-down algorithm processes the total population counts first and then processes the remaining queries to be consistent with those population counts. For larger data products that have even more sparsity, like the demographic and housing characteristics files, uh, the number and order of these passes uh, can help to further diminish the impact of sparsity on the algorithm and allows us to prioritize accuracy for certain tabulations. The top-down algorithm is remarkably flexible, and the algorithm can be finely tuned to meet various accuracy targets. Uh, this tuning is largely done through the allocation of privacy loss budget by ge geographic level and by query. Here you'll see the allocation of privacy loss budget by geographic level that's reflected in the April 2021 demonstration data release. In addition to the global rho, epsilon, and delta parameters for the person's file on the left uh, and the unit's file on the right, you can also see how the shares of privacy loss budget have been allocated across the different geographic levels within the two files. Uh, you can see that the tuning we performed to meet our accuracy targets for the redistricting use case allocated a substantial share of privacy loss budget, or rho, uh, to the block and optimized block group levels. And in addition to allocating privacy loss budget by geographic level, the top-down algorithm allocates shares of privacy loss budget to each of the queries performed in the noisy measurement stage at each geographic level. As you can see here, the detailed query, which is the full cross of the household and group quarters, element by voting age, by Hispanic, by CENRACE, uh, gets a sizable share of the privacy loss budget at all geographic levels. You'll also see higher allocations of privacy loss budget to the total population query at the optimized block group level and county level, uh, and to the special query for total population at the state level that supports the separation of tribal areas in the optimized spine, which Michael Ratcliffe discussed a moment ago. Remember, the total query, which is the total population count, is held in variance at the national and state levels, so no privacy loss budget is expended on this query at either level. Um, the row allocation assigned to total at the state level in this table it's actually the amount of privacy loss budget assigned to the state level queries for the total population of all American Indian Alaska Native tribal areas within the state and for the total population of the remainder of the state for those 36 in 2010 or 38 in 2020 states that include American Indian Alaska Native tribal areas. And before I open the floor for my colleagues to answer some more of your questions, uh, I'd like to encourage you to join us for the remaining webinars in this series. Uh, tomorrow, May 14th, 
uh, we'll be highlighting the detailed summary metrics from our April 2021 demonstration data release. And next Friday, May 21st, uh, we will be providing an analysis of our empirical assessments of the, the recent demonstration data for the Redistricting and Voting Rights Act use cases. Uh, if you would like to stay updated on our development of the 2020 Disclosure Avoidance System, please subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we send out updates every couple of weeks with the latest information on the development and implementation of the DAS. And if you'd like to learn more about our modernization of disclosure avoidance methods for the 2020 Census, check out our website. Uh, we have a wide array of useful resources, uh, including frequently asked questions, fact sheets, videos, blogs, and, and much more. And with that, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce Megan Mowry, who will help uh, moderate some of your remaining questions, and my colleagues and I will be happy to answer them for you. Thank you so much, Michael. Hello, everyone. I'm Megan Mowry, and apologies for um, showing you my messy office. I couldn't get my virtual background to load. Um, let's, Michael. Michael and Michael, this is an extremely technical web webinar, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that came in in the chat or um, that that I think will help people sort of de disentangle some of that more technical language. So first, baseline question, does the move from uh, differential privacy to this zero concentrated differential privacy, does it increase the risk? that people's data can be re-identified? So that's a great question. I'll, I'll start, but then I would, I would love to, to pass it over to, um, to Philip or uh, Pavel to, to chime in as well. Um, I, I guess the, the question is, uh, does it increase risk compared to what? Um, the switch to zero concentrated differential privacy still allows us a full privacy accounting uh, it just changes the, the the mechanism by which that accounting takes place. So uh, instead of just considering your your value of, of epsilon, you have to consider that pair. Uh, and within that pair, that delta element helps you understand um, like at, at what point that privacy protection might degrade. If if you set delta infinitesimally small, or set it to zero you would be back in the world essentially of traditional differential privacy. So what this does is it just essentially tells you um, what's your confidence in the privacy loss guarantee reflected by any particular level of epsilon. Uh, Philip or Pavel, do you want to add to that? Um, I actually thought you did an excellent job addressing it, Michael. Uh, they're, so well, what you're comparing to is, is the principal question. Um, if you're comparing ZCDP to pure differential privacy, uh, ZCDP is um, uh, a qualitatively slightly weaker guarantee in terms of privacy, uh, but it's tunable in the same way. Um, and as you push those parameters closer to the extreme values that Michael mentioned, you get a guarantee uh, that is sort of increasingly similar to the pure differential privacy one. Um, and in any case, uh, if you're using ZCDP uh, or pure differential privacy, uh, in either of those two worlds, um, you're getting uh, a guarantee that just didn't exist with, with methods that predated these. Thanks for that. That's helpful. Um, I'm going to jump to a couple of really simple questions. Um, one, uh, a couple of folks have asked, how do I find these slides? Um, and so we will make sure that in the chat you can see the link to um, where all the slides for this webinar, as well as all the other webinars in this series are available. We're also making the recordings available. It does take us a couple days to get that, a few days to get that information up on the uh, web, but please circle back if you'd like to review this or um, take a closer look at the slides. Another relatively easy question, um, someone asked, is this the first, is the most recent uh, PPMF, the most recent demonstration data, the first demonstration data that uses this zero con concentrated differential privacy, or have we seen that in prior demonstration data? 
So, um, uh, no, this is not the first that uses it. We actually did make the switch to the discrete Gaussian distribution in the fall. Uh, I don't off the top of my head recall whether it was for the September or November release. Uh, but yeah, no, we did make that shift before, but it was still at the, the lower privacy loss budget that we've been holding consistent across the first four demonstration data releases. So this is the first using the new mechanism with the higher privacy loss budget. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, I think this is a really interesting question. So one of the questions says, with the top-down algorithm, are geographies that are closer to the top of the spine assumed to be more accurate regardless of the size of the population? So I think the question is, if you have um, a, a, a block group that has, you know, 3,000 people in it, uh, or let's say 10,000 people in it, and a tract, which is higher up the spine, but has slightly less people in it, will that tract sort of be assumed to be more accurate than the, the lower level geography with more people in it? So uh, that's not exactly a, a straightforward question to answer, as, as it might seem. Um, the better way to think of it that is the absolute accuracy in terms of, of the count accuracy uh, for any geography uh, is largely going to be determined by um, two things. The, the, the distance from the spine, uh, so on-spine entities um, will, will, at any level of geography, will likely have higher count accuracy than ones that are farther from the spine. Um, and the other is the uh, allocation of privacy loss budget that's um, dedicated to that particular uh, query at that particular geographic level. Um, so the, the count accuracy is going to vary depending on those two things. But um, you can also think of accuracy in terms of relative accuracy. Uh, and because we're tuning on count accuracy through the system, the relative accuracy of any given calculation at any given level of geography will, uh, of course, be more accurate in relative terms, um, depend, like when the underlying population increases. The, the same absolute count difference becomes a much smaller percentage difference when you're dealing with larger populations. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, there's a couple questions here, and I think, I mean, uh, I know that you don't have state-specific information at hand, but a few folks have been asking, you know, they're doing their analyses of the most recent demonstration data and still seeing a shift from urban to rural areas. Some people talk about specific states in here, but maybe you could talk generally about how whether the algorithm was able to kind of a, completely address the shift from urban to rural or if people should still expect some shift there? So this is essentially um, a consequence of one of the requirements that was baked into the top-down algorithm early on, and that was the requirement that we output internally consistent microdata uh, into decennial tabulation. Uh, that requirement means that there will inherently be at least a, a minimum level of of bias, if you will, um, because of the, the fact that you can't report negative numbers. That when you have a, a location that has a, a, a noisy measurement, a, a query that would result in a zero or a one, uh, and you add noise to it, that noise could be negative, and that could pull the noisy answer into the negative. And so, because we can't report out negative values, we have to bring those back up to zero. Um, there's, there's an upward push on low areas and a corresponding downward push on large areas and upward for small groups and downward for large groups. Um, now, we've done a number of improvements to the algorithm um, over the last year and a half uh, that have uh, mitigated that to a, a very large degree. So if you look at the demonstration, the April demonstration data, you'll see there is significantly less of that type of distortion than there was in the uh, in the prior um, demonstration data, particularly than the October 2019 files. 
but it, it's probably not completely gone. Um, but if you are, as you're analyzing the files, if you do notice um, distortions like that that are of particular note or that are particularly worrisome, bring those to our attention because uh, those, there are certainly additional things that can be done to, to mitigate those impacts and, and like, let us know when and where you see them and, and we'll see what we can do with those. Yeah, thank you, and, and that's a great point. All of the all of the questions in here that that relate to analyses that you're doing now, we we really want to see all of those so we can um, see what we can do to address your concerns. So and please. Uh, just, oh, go ahead. If, since urban and rural were mentioned, if I can just put a plug in, uh, we have we have published proposed criteria for defining urban areas for the 2020 census based on 2020 data. Um, that com the public comment period is open for another seven days through May 20th. So um, if you're interested, you can get in touch with me offline or we have information on our urban rural page on census.gov and we would love to hear uh, thoughts and comments on our proposals. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm becoming more and more of a geography fan every day. So. Uh, Definitely encourage folks to dig in on that. Um, there's a couple questions here about uh, uncertainty metrics, and I, I know um, that I think in particular people are saying, are you going to cover uncertainty metrics in a future webinar, or is there a place that they can go to learn more about what kind of you know confidence in intervals um, will be available to data users so they can best interpret the data? Can anyone speak a little bit to what the plan is for that? Uh, so I can speak to the issue, but not necessarily to the plan yet. Um, so uh, one of the real advantages of the differentially private approaches to disclosure avoidance over traditional approaches like the swapping mechanism that we used in the past uh, is that we can be fully transparent about what the impact of the mechanism is on the resulting data. Um, in prior decades, um, disclosure avoidance absolutely had an impact on the accuracy and fitness for use of the data, uh, but quantifying that impact had to be kept secret um, because you had to protect your swap rates and protect the uh, assessment of the impact on, on accuracy. Uh, you had to keep that confidential to prevent reverse engineering of the confidential data. With formally private methods like the top-down algorithm, we can be completely transparent about uh, pretty much every aspect of, of the implementation, including all of our code, all of our parameters, uh, and the, the exact noise distributions from which noise is selected and, and the, the privacy loss budget allocations that, that determine those. Um, from all that information, you can calculate um, margins of uncertainty for, for any uh, calculation, sorry, for any statistic that's published. Um, you can build that into your analyses. Now, the Census Bureau has uh, committed to providing our data users with guidance on interpreting the fitness for use of the 2020 Census data products. Um, what form of that guidance on interpreting fitness for use will take is still being worked out. Uh, so I can't say whether it's going to be through the publication of, of margins of uncertainty or, or some other mechanism, those details are still are still to be determined. Uh, but there are a number of ways that um, that kind of fitness for use guidance could be could be developed, either by us or by those outside the Census Bureau. Um, and as as we as we work out the details of what what that guidance will actually look like, we'll be sharing that publicly. Yeah, thank you so much. I know that. Lots of folks are hungry for more information on that, so I appreciate you kind of pointing the pathway to so to how um, how we'll be talking that through. There's a, a couple of questions here on um, how you quantify distance from the spine. If if there's a way to quantify distance from the spine in a way that's kind of predicted predictive of what kind of error will be introduced by that distance from the spine. I know that's a, a technical and complicated question, but I wonder if you could give any guidance on that. I will defer to Ryan on that because he knows the optimization process better than anybody. So, so 
Uh, it kind of the, the most straightforward notion of distance from the spine is um, the minimum number of on-spine geo units that you need to add or subtract from one another in order to derive the geographic extent of the off-spine entity. Um, so we call that the off-spine entity distance. Um, and you can just think of it as uh, just a distance metric, how far the off-spine entity is away from the spine. And generally, the error um, errors increase um, as that metric uh, for entities that would have, which would have a higher off-spine entity distance. Um, so generally, adding, having to add or subtract a lot of these, a lot of these on-spine entities in order to derive the off-spine entity will will uh, increase the error. Got it. Uh, and is there a place where people can find more information about, you know, how to know how far from the spine a uh, geography is? Is there is there anywhere we have more information about that particular component? I I don't believe we've actually released anything yet on that. Um, there is a document that's in the process of being reviewed right now um, that I believe will be available in the future, though. Got it. Uh, I will say, by the way, there are so many questions in this Q&A, we are definitely not getting to them all. We have about eight more minutes before we have to wrap up. So I, I just want to put in a plug, if you have questions that you don't get answered here on the webinar today, First, we really encourage you to come back to our other webinars. Second, you can always submit questions to us uh, via our, our email inbox. Michael, do you have a slide with that uh, information? Uh, yes, give me one second. Uh, Great. Michael, bring that all up for you all. But uh, let's keep keep going on the questions for, for as long as we can. Um, someone just asked for a repetition. Uh, is more... Okay. Actually, I don't have that here, unfortunately. Um, the email address is 2020DAS, short for Disclosure Avoidance System. So 2020DAS at census.gov. Great. Thank you, Michael. And uh, someone just asked for a quick repetition, and I just want to clarify this because I think it's important. Um, is more of the privacy loss budget introduced into the smallest geographies. I wonder, Michael, if you could just run back to that um, to that slide that shows a little bit more of how the privacy loss budget is allocated. Uh, and one thing I want to correct in the question, it says, is more of the privacy loss budget, so less accuracy introduced to the smallest geographies? But I think if I'm right, that's, that's actually backwards from the reality. The more privacy loss budget you have allocated to a place, the more the more um, accurate that geography is. Is that right? Am I saying that's correct? The, the more the more privacy loss budget that you throw at uh, a particular query, the in relative terms, the more accurate it will be compared to the other queries. Um, so you'll notice that the the substantial amount of privacy loss budget that we allocated to the optimized block group level and the block level. Um, that was done primarily to improve the accuracy of those off-spine entities, which uh, we discussed before, um, because in many cases, uh, those off-spine entities need to be constructed by adding or subtracting block groups or blocks. Got it. And this, this sort of allocation really kind of is what you mean by tuning, right? We've got a couple questions in here about, you know, how, what is tuning versus a criteria? Um, can, you, so, can you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, the, the idea there is that there's lots of different ways to assess accuracy or fitness for use. Uh, accuracy for what purpose, accuracy of, of which queries at which levels. And there's going to be lots of trade-offs uh, involved um, in any disclosure avoidance system, uh, even using traditional methods. Uh, but it, this is, it's made more explicit uh, in formal privacy with the, the explicit privacy accounting uh, that differential privacy offers. Um, so with those trade-offs, you need to have kind of standards against which to evaluate, uh, to evaluate those trade-offs. Um, the accuracy targets that we set um, that we've discussed in previous webinars uh, were developed based on um, stakeholder feedback, uh, and, and we developed accuracy targets that we uh, thought reflected those use cases as presented to us. Uh, and then we tuned the parameters 
with those accuracy targets in mind. So essentially we um, experiment with different allocations of privacy loss budget across geographic levels and across the query sets to find the ones that um, best captured or best met those accuracy targets that we developed, as well as other accuracy targets that um, we had developed internally for, for other priority uses of these data. Uh, and so the, the tuning is, is the, the adjustment of the parameters and dials of the system and your evaluation of the results of changing those parameters. Uh, that evaluation is done against whatever accuracy targets that you set. Got it. Thank you. And very many thanks to Michael Ratcliffe for um, rapid fire answering geography questions in the chat. Michael, I wonder if you could just pop back to one of the slides that shows the spine because we're getting a lot of questions about sort of what's on spine, off spine, just getting that clarity again. and. Uh, Michael, can you just one more time just walk us through what what are the, what are those on spine geographies yeah. versus off spine geographies? Sure. Yeah. So when we talk about the on spine geographies, what we're talking about are the are those geographic areas that are in that central hierarchy: uh, nation, region, division, states, counties, tracts, block groups, blocks. And specifically, when we're talking about spine in the in the context of disclosure avoidance system processing. It states the counties, the tracks, the block groups, the blocks. These are the geographies that nest neatly within within each other. So what that means is you'll never have a county that crosses a state boundary. You'll never have a census tract that crosses a county boundary. Uh, one thing to note, uh, there are population thresholds, uh, minimum, optimum, maximum pop, uh, suggested population thresholds for census tracts. Because of that aspect of the criteria, you will, when you have a county, so the optimum population for a census tract is 4,000 people, when you have a county of, say, and the minimum is 1,200, when you have a county of less than 1,200 people, you're only going to have one census tract. We will not cross a county line to make that, that census tract larger to hit that optimum population. So there's a constraint there. There's a population criterion, and then there's a spatial criterion that, that kind of operates in some ways. Uh, as a constraint. The off-spine geographies are all the other geographies that are to the right and left of that central hierarchy. And these geographies are going to, they block that up to all of those. So when we're defining our, actually when we're preparing our final geography for the census for tabulation, we compile the boundaries, we update the boundaries of all of the higher level geographic areas, block groups, tracks, places, counties, uh, you name it, all the ones off to the side. And then we define the census blocks. So the census blocks are the last geographic unit defined because they have to adhere to all of those boundaries, all of the, the, the network, the lattice work of boundaries and roads and other features that exist at higher levels. But you can always be assured that, a census, that census blocks will add up to every other geographic unit. All the other geographies are going to get split in some fashion. All the other on-spine geographies will be split in some fashion by the off-spine geographies. So a place can be, Got if it. you follow the line, a place can be in two counties. It can never be in two, place, in two states, but it can sometimes be in two, two counties. It, it can split tracks in multiple ways, and so on and so on. To get to the question in the chat, about enumeration areas, we actually don't use that term anymore, haven't for several, for quite a few decades. We do talk about collection geography, and starting in 2000, we completely separated our concepts of collection geography and tabulation geography. So the collection geography exists solely to carry out census operations, and then the tabulation geography, and then it's put aside, and the tabulation geography, everything you see on this hierarchy chart is what's used to publish, to tabulate and then disseminate data. One clarifying question before we um, wrap up. I know we're right at time, but um, I, you, you mentioned that those offline geographies are never going to cross state lines, but there is an exception to that, right? Tribal geographies might, might cross well, state lines. I, I was referring to places. We sometimes get the, you know, we, we'll sometimes hear from people saying, well, what about Kansas City? So there are two Kansas cities, there's two Texarkanas, and so on. Cities are creatures of the state. 
But you're absolutely right. Tribal geographies will cross state lines. The Navajo Nation is in three states. Um, urban areas will cross state, state lines. Metropolitan areas. So, you know, if you follow the lines on the hierarchy chart, you'll see those relationships. It's not a perfect view. This is a conceptual view of trying to bring some order to a very complex and sometimes messy set of geographic units. Uh, but yeah, the, there are um, so tribal areas, yes, will cross state lines. And so we've gotten questions about the Navajo Nation um, and Indian areas that cross, uh, American Indian areas that cross state lines. So when we're applying the American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian pathway here, uh, the, Navajo, the portion of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico will be grouped with all of the other American Indian areas in New Mexico. The portion in Arizona will be grouped with all the other tribal areas in Arizona, and the portion in Utah, and so forth. And Got then it will be brought back together into a single unit when we publish the data. Incredibly helpful, and I really appreciate you clarifying that. I know it's a, it's a point that's been really, really tricky for people to understand. Um, thank you so much. I know we're at time. Michael Haas, do you want to uh, take us out? Sure. So I just want to thank everybody again for joining us today, and I'll go back to our uh, schedule here. So um, please join us for the subsequent webinars in this series. Again, we have one tomorrow on the detailed summary metrics. Uh, and one next Friday on our uh, empirical assessment of the, 2020, the April 2021 demonstration data for the Redistricting and Voting Rights Act use cases. Uh, both should be uh, great sessions. Um, if you'd like to see the recordings of the prior sessions in this series, uh, those are available on our website, as we previously mentioned. Uh, and with that, uh, I will say thank you to everyone and hope you have a great rest of the, your day. That will conclude today's conference, and we thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time. Speakers, please stand by for your post-conference.